Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study once again. And it feels so good to be back in Memphis and talking with you all. I hate it that we can't sit together and talk and eat and do what we're used to. But one of these days, that's going to happen. I have great faith. We're still looking at the book of John. And if you've noticed, the Gospel of John is much different than the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels seem to go a little more chronologically with Christ's life. But the book of John is dealing more with theological questions, and John's not so much interested in giving us a running account of Jesus' ministry here on earth. So tonight, I want you to listen to the portions that come out of theology and of Jesus and his relationship to God as the Father and his relationship to us. So I begin tonight looking at chapter 5, verses 31 through 36. I hope you have your Bible. Read along with me if you can. If not, listen carefully. We're talking about witnessing to Christ. And Jesus says, If I bear witness about myself, my witness need not be accepted as true. But it is another who is bearing witness about me, and I know that the witness which he bears about me is true. You sent your messengers to John, and he bore witness to the truth. But the testimony which I received is not from any man, but I say these things that you might be saved. He was the lamp which burns and shines. For a time you were pleased to take pleasure in his light. But I have a greater testimony than John's. The works which the Father granted me to accomplish, the very works which I do, are evidence about me to prove that my, my, my Father has sent me. Now once again in this scripture, Jesus is answering charges of his opponents against him. And his opponents, the Pharisees, are demanding, what evidence can you produce that your claims are true? And Jesus argues with them in a way that the rabbis would understand, for he goes and he uses their very own methods. And he begins by admitting the universal principle that we all understand that the unsupported evidence of one person cannot be taken as valid proof. He said, he should, she, he said, two arguments is not proof, it's just a disagreement. There must be in the Bible at least two witnesses. Deuteronomy tells us, On the evidence of two witnesses, or of three witnesses, he that is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. And again, Deuteronomy says, A single witness shall not prevail against a man for any crime, for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses shall a charge be sustained. And then if you jump over to the New Testament, Paul, in his letter to the, Car to the Corinthians, he told them he had come to rebuke and to discipline them in the problems that they were having, but he says that all of his charges shall be confirmed by two or three witnesses. In the early church, it was the rule that no charge could be made against an elder unless it was supported by multiple witnesses. And it was accepted totally that a man's evidence about himself would not be accepted. The Mishnah said, a man is not worthy of belief when he is speaking about himself. An ancient law well knew that self-interest had an effect on what man said about his own being. So Jesus agrees that his own unsupported testimony to himself doesn't have to be true. But, he says, there are other witnesses to him. He says that another is his witness, and he means God. He will return to that in a minute, but for the moment, he cites John the Baptist, who had repeatedly been a wonderful and the first witness for him. And he says that John was a, like a lamp, which burns and shines. And that was a perfect tribute to him because a lamp come, makes borrowed light. A lamp does not light itself. Someone has to light it. And John had warmth like a light, for his was not the cold message 
that comes from the mind or from the intellect. Rather, it had a warmth to it, warmth that comes from the burning message of a kindled heart. And John had light, like a lamp does. And the function of light is to lead or to guide. And John pointed the way to Jesus and pointed the way to true repentance in God. And lastly, if you think about a lamp, eventually it burns itself out. And giving light, it consumes itself. John, if you will remember, was to decrease while Jesus increased. And that's true of us as we live our lives as witnesses for God. Eventually, our lives burn out. But Jesus doesn't even plead about John's evidence. He says it's not the human evidence of any fallible man that he's going to produce to support his claims. So he produces the witness of his works. And he had done that when John sent him from, from sent to him when John was in prison to ask if he was the Messiah. And he had told those that John had sent, his inquiring envoys, if you will, to go back and to tell John the Baptist what they saw happening. But Jesus does cite his works, not to point to himself, but to point to the power of God the Father working in him and through him. And his supreme witness is God. So we jump to the 37th verse of chapter 5 where it said, And the Father who sent me has borne witness about me. You have never heard his voice, nor have you ever seen his form. You do not have his word dwelling in you because you do not believe in the one whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they which bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I receive no glory from men, but I know you and I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I came in the name of my Father, and yet you do not receive me. The Jews searched the law. They read the law. They knew the law, and yet they failed to recognize Christ when he came. Why? What was wrong? Here they were, the best Bible students in the world, people who meticulously and continually read the scripture. They rejected Jesus. How could that happen? Well, one thing is very clear, and the answer is easy. They read the scripture in the wrong way. They read it with a closed mind. They read it not to search for God, but to find arguments that would support their own positions. If you think about it and look at it, they really didn't love God. What they loved was their own ideas about Him. They didn't want to humbly learn a theology from Scripture. They wanted a Scripture that would defend the theology which they themselves had produced. And in today's world, there is still danger that we sometimes use the Bible to prove our beliefs and not to test them, but they made even a bigger mistake. They regarded God. They felt that God had given men a written revelation. Well, the revelation of God is a revelation in history. It is not God speaking, but it is about God acting and what He has done. The Bible in and of itself is not God's revelation. It is the record, the record of His revelation. But they worshiped the words of the Bible. There is only one proper way, and this is William Barclay talking now, to read the Bible, and that's as it's all pointing directly to Jesus. And then many of the things which puzzle us, and those things that sometimes distress us, are clearly seen as stages on the way, pointing forward to Christ, who is the supreme revelation of God, and whose light, and whose light all other revelation is to be tested. The Jews they worshiped a God who wrote rather than worshiping a God who acted. 
Therefore, when Christ came, they did not recognize him. The function of the scriptures is not to give life, as the Jews believed. The function of the scriptures is to point to the one who can give life. In verse 34, Jesus had said that the purpose of his words were that you may be saved. And here he says, I'm not looking for glory from any man. And that's to say, I'm not arguing like I am because I want to win an argument. I'm not talking like I am because I want to score points off of you and win the applause of men. I'm talking because I love you and I want you to be saved. And there's something so special in this thought. When people oppose us and we argue back, what is our main feeling in arguing? Are we arguing because our pride has been wounded? Does our conceit or our ego, do we have those that hate any kind of failure? Do we get annoyed just with people when they disagree with us? And do we have a desire maybe to cram our own thoughts and opinions down other people's thought throats because we don't consider them maybe quite as smart as we are? But Jesus talked as he did only because he loved men. His voice sometimes was stern, but in that sternness you can hear the accent of a yearning love, a love that wants him to come to the Father. Jesus says, if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. And we know the Jews had their succession of imposters that claimed to be the Messiah. And each of those had his own following. Think about today. Why do men follow imposters? Because they are men whose claims correspond to other men's wants and desires. The imposters came promising empires and victory and material prosperity. Jesus never offered any of that. Jesus came offering a cross. The characteristic of an imposter, whether it was back then or whether it's today, is the offer of the easy way. Jesus never offered the easy way. Jesus offered the hard way of God. The imposters perished and Christ still lives with us. So I leave these thoughts with you tonight. The scribes and the Pharisees, all they wanted was the praise of men. They dressed in such a way that everyone would recognize them. They praised in such a way that everyone would see them and everyone would hear them. They loved the front seats of the synagogue. They loved the deferential greetings from men and women on the street. And just because of all of that, they were not able to hear the true voice of God. And why is the question? And the answer is this. So long as a man measures himself against his fellow human beings, he will be content. The point is not, am I as good as my neighbor? The point is, am I as good as God? What do I look like to God? So long as we judge ourselves by human comparison, there's plenty of room for self-satisfaction. And that self-satisfaction kills faith. Because faith is born of the sense of need. When we need something and we can't supply it, then we have to fall back on faith. But when we compare ourselves with Jesus Christ, we become humbled to the lowest possible level. And when we get there, then our faith is born. For there is nothing left for us to do once we hit rock bottom than to trust in the mercy and the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God. We compare ourselves to Jesus and to God, not to our fellow men. It's good to be with you tonight. I look forward to seeing you Sunday. Have a good evening. Everybody stay healthy as possible. Good night.